over here. <laughs> it's working now. All right, so here, here's what we're gonna do. Woo! Take two, everybody. Hey, welcome to Fortify Live. This week's episode is going to be talking about how do you work with disengaged and disgruntled employees. Now, we had a little snafu when we started this. If you've hung in there, that's great. Like I said, this is really a live presentation. So we have a checklist that we're going to have to check next time. All right. So I have a special guest. Her name is Marilyn Sherman. She's a colleague and a friend and a Hall of Fame keynote speaker. And like I said earlier, I can't believe that I even got her because she's usually traveling all over the world and speaking on stages and inspiring audiences to do their best. And so I want to welcome her to the show. Marilyn, welcome to the show. Hey, Ford. Great to see you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> well, well, thank you. So thank you for all those par participants. So as we do this, thank you for the comments. If we are live now on Facebook, on two pages, LinkedIn, and YouTube Live, if you have any right. comments, please type them into um, the live stream comments or below the post. They do show up here. And we're going to try to answer the questions as much as we can during this presentation, as well on on future episodes. So Marilyn, you were yes. just starting to tell me what are some of the challenges that are facing. So instead of, you know, I know you know how to inspire staff to perform their best, but what are some of the challenges that you're seeing in the organizations that you speak to around the globe? Well, I get asked all the time, how do you motivate your staff? How do you motivate your people? How do you get them reengaged and reignited in their passion for their work? And my answer is always the same. Well, it depends. Um, you have to ask them. Yeah, people are all motivated by different things. And they're also at different stages of what's going on in this world. I mean, let's face it. We've all gone through a lot in the last couple of years. I mean, it. it I mean, everything, everything has shifted. And for the first time in our generation, everybody went through it at the same time. However, everybody's reactions are different. And it takes me all the way back to Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who wrote a book called On Death and Dying. And she has the five stages of loss. So there's denial and bargaining and anger and depression until you get to acceptance. Now, here's the thing about those five stages. There are a lot of people that were in denial about what we went through. And if you're in denial about having the world um, shifting, you're not going to be proactive and coming up with new and better ways to serve your customers in this new world. So when you're in a denial stage, if you've got employees that are in denial about what's going on in the world, um, you're going to manage them very differently than if you've got employees who are already in the acceptance mode because they're um, flexible with change and they understand what's going on and they know the why and the what, and they step up to the plate. So you have to really go to the level of your employees, engage with them to find out where they are, and then to give them what they need in terms of more information, more direction, more understanding about this is why we're doing what we're doing now. And that's the best way to re-engage your employees is to find out where they're at and then help them along that path to get them to the level of acceptance. So, so... I understand the different levels and certainly the different dynamics of the, of the workplace culture. I mean, we've got millennials and Gen Z and Gen Y and the connected generation and boomers and you know, you name it. Right. And there's so many different personalities. And one of the terms that, you know, you see in the news, which you know took off, which I mentioned earlier, which I think is crap. You know, they have talked about quiet quitting and that that's okay, that you should just work just enough not to get fired. And I always think to myself as an entrepreneur and someone who works with a lot of business owners, I think that's crap. I mean, I think that it should be value for value. You should pay your employees value for value. And as they add more value, you should be able to hopefully be able to give them raises and to reward them. But I don't believe in this entitlement mentality that people should just get paid even though they don't want to work. Um, now, right. we have very different approaches. I spend my time speaking to audiences about business growth and accelerating change and, and you know how do you find, attract, and keep staff, but not so much from a culture standpoint like what you did. So when you think about, you know, when you go in, what's a message that you would say to a business owner? Wh where do they need to know to be prepared to deal? You just said you, they need to ask, right? So that's one thing. What's that's something one. else? What's something else that, they, that a business owner, if you're watching this as a business owner, a franchise brand or a global brand, what's another thing that uh, they need to know from an executive position or as an owner that they can do to really improve accountability to improve performance because you know you've got disengaged on one end of the scale and then you've got you know top performers and rock stars and so the topic we're talking about doesn't mean that you have people that aren't engaged but maybe they're not performing to their best so what what should an executive need 
to do or know to be successful in this is this challenging times? Well, they have to truly understand what people go through when they're dealing with change. And my experience has been that um, it's human nature when you're going through change, people default to either a victim, a vacationer, or a volunteer. Now, victims to change are people like they sit back and they wait for someone to tell them what to do. They start to complain about, well, they don't, um, you know, why they won't listen to me. I have no voice. So why even bother to uh, show up? right? So there's a victim mentality. Then there's also a vacationer mentality. And this is where people are checked out. They're just, they, they would rather be anywhere else than at work. So they're just doing the minimum to get by. They're, they're so disengaged that people aren't really tracking with what they're doing. And then there's the volunteer. And the volunteer is the person who steps up to the plate. They know that things have to change. They understand that things have to change. And so they are, the big R word, they are resourceful. They know they're not alone going through this change. So they know how to ask for help. They know how to garner resources in order to make the change a success. Now, the challenge is these rock stars, these, these volunteers, if they don't have the support, like if, if, if you've got a team of people and some are volunteers and some are victims and some are vacationers, the rock stars are always going to step up to the plate, but they are eventually going to get burned out. And the victims and the vacationers are going to get away with not pulling their weight. And so you're actually doing a disservice to your brand and to your people and to your rock stars, because if you don't, um, if you don't get those vacationers and victims to step up, you're going to lose the people that are. Now, I have been doing um, change workshops for a really long time, and they, my audiences always agree, of course, we're going to be more resourceful. We're going to ask more questions. We're going to utilize the resources around us. Um, of course, we all want to be volunteers. And I say, okay, then let's practice. And I have them do an activity, and literally 99% of the people default to victim. Because human nature is when we're faced with change, we become siloed. What does this change mean for me? What am I going to lose? Because human nature is people equate loss with change. And change doesn't have to be loss. I mean, you look at the companies out there, you work with a lot of franchisees out there. Right. There are people that are there, they're doing so much better as a result of having to, to shift their service that they provide and how they provide it. And all of a sudden, because of their adaptability and because of the way they met the needs of their customers quicker, they're actually doing better now than they were before the global pandemic. So, um, so resourceful, being resourceful is the number one thing that you have to do to get these people re-engaged. But you have to understand. So managers, leaders, owners have to understand that people will default to being a victim because they they become a silo unto themselves. So you can't complain about having siloed organizations if you are the one that's creating the silo. So how do you do that? You talk about resources. You talk about we're all in this together. You talk about what can you bring to the table and what do you need? What kind of support do you need to do your job as best as you can? What do you need to bring the best you to work? And so when you are now engaging with people, they feel heard, they feel valued, they feel appreciated, and it's easier for them to show up in a better way. Yeah. So when, you know, I always look at, you know, when you hire somebody, you want to onboard them, you want to socialize, you want to train them to standard, right? And they have to have clear expectations of what success looks like. We've talked about that on a couple of the live episodes we've done. So when is it time? When do you decide that it's time to free that person up for new opportunities? <laughs> Invite them to go work for your competition. Yeah. yeah. When, when, <laughs> when, is, when, them. when do you finally just say enough's enough? You know, I've given them the resources. I've given them the training. We've got a good culture. We have two-way communication. We have feedback loops. We're doing 360s. When is it time that you just can say, okay, maybe I hired wrong and it's time to free them up for new opportunities? Do you have any thoughts around that? Well, I do have some thoughts and you kind of glossed over it a little bit because um, if someone is not performing to the level that is expected and they obviously... <laughs> <laughs> they obviously have to know what's been what's expected of them. Right. Um, and if they're not performing, then there needs to be a conversation about why. If um, if if their life depended on it, could they do it? And if the answer is yes, they could. 
they're just not doing it, then you have to go down the discipline route and you have to follow whatever procedure you have in place to discipline an employee for not doing what they are supposed to be doing, what they're contracted doing to do, uh, what their employment agreement. But don't they is. go to victimhood then though? Because I mean, you know, you say, okay, you agreed to do X, Y, and Z and clearly you didn't do it. And then you, well, instead of taking responsibility, I mean, I've had staff cause you know, it's, it, it's a business and sometimes they just don't take responsibility, even though it really was their responsibility. Well, that's the thing. If they could do it, and right. they are not doing it, then there has to be um, there has to be discipline in place. There has to be something in place that makes sense, but they have to be clear about it. That's why you have um, right. step one, you have to have the conversation, you have to document the conversation. Step two, um, okay, what is the consequence to the behavior or a consequence to that person if they don't change their behavior? And and if you maybe it's a second chance or maybe it's a third chance, depending on what your policy and procedure is, um, and then th so that there's no surprise to say, well, maybe this right. just isn't a good fit for you. Gotcha. Now, what if they couldn't do what they're supposed to do, even if their life depended on it? Well, then no amount of discipline is going to help that person to perform. They need training. They need um, explanation. They need an understanding. They need the resources to do what they are supposed to do. So first and foremost, you have to ask, could they do it if their life depended on it? And if they could and they're not, then it's discipline. And if they still don't step up, then you invite them to go to your competition. <laughs> and if you're, uh, if they couldn't do it, um, then they need help. They need training. They need resources. Well, I, I, I'm going to be watching this one again more, more often. And, and it might just be a video that I have everybody watch who's onboarding um, in, in my organization. All right. So tell me about this whole, you know, you've been known, you've got a, a brand about sitting in the front row and, but really it's, it's more than that. But talk to me a little bit about, you know, what does it mean to step up and to sit in the front row? And what is that whole concept about? I love this concept because I, my whole front row philosophy is that every one of us have this venue of life and we choose as where we sit every single day. We get to choose where we, where we sit in this venue of life and who we sit with. So balcony is a seat that you can choose, but balcony seats are not good seats. Balcony seats are view obstructed. You're disengaged. And I was even thinking about this last night. I had someone in an audience one time way back in the day where they chose to sit in the very back of the room, even though it wasn't full, like it wasn't the last seat available. There are plenty of seats up right, front right. and they complained that they couldn't hear anything. <laughs> it's like, now that just makes no sense to right. me. And it also makes no sense to me that people come in early and they sit in the back. And it's because they want to not be, uh, they don't want to risk like being called out. And so it's like a false risk that, you know, it's a false fear that they have. So balcony seats are not good seats. And then there is general admission. And general admission is where people get into sort of a comfort zone. And your comfort zone leads to a rut and a rut leads to mediocrity. And that's a, that, that's a quote from Dr. Nito Quibane, one of my mentors that you know very well. And um, so your comfort zone, eventually, where you just accept that, ah, it's okay. It's not bad. It's, it's okay. It's, it could be worse. It's not the best, but it could be worse. Well, that mentality of being in general admission, eventually you are, you will slip into mediocrity, which is then eventually a balcony seat. And then there's the front row. And the front row is where you get to say, it doesn't get any better than this. I love my job. I love what I do. I am making a difference. I am making an impact on my team, on my customers, on my, my community, on the world. And every single day you get to choose which of these options you want to sit in, the balcony general mission or front row. And then once you decide what your front row looks like, be careful who you allow into your front row. I mean, there was just something political that just happened because a former president invited a rapper who happened to bring someone to the dinner table who um, was very controversial. And his he was in denial of like, well, I didn't know. And it's like, you have to be very careful who you invite into your front yeah. row because your front row is high high rent district and location, location, location. Some people need to be loved from the balcony and you want to surround yourself with other people who are front row kind of people. So it's a mentality, but it's also a physical thing. You know, when I go into a conference, I want to sit in the front row because I want to be totally engaged. Plus you get to sit up there with the other VIPs. 
Right. And sometimes there are empty seats up there and all it takes is a little bit of courage to get out of your comfort zone to move up there to the front row. So if you're in a, if you're a staff person listening to this and maybe yeah. you, you know, aren't, aren't, you know, what are the studies, regardless of what study I did a study, there's going to be a link in the, in the description where you can get an employment strategies for business growth study and you, it's not, nothing you have to buy. We'll post the link later after we do the replay, but um, it has a whole employment study that, you know, goes into the real depths of why people stay, why they leave, you know, some mm -hmm. health checklists and things like that. But if you're an employee, if you're a staff member and you're watching this today and you're disgruntled because the stats say, you know, 75% of most employees are actively disengaged or whatever the Gallup poll is this week, right? The bottom line is there's too many people that are disengaged, which is why we were talking about on this topic. But if you're an employee and you're disengaged, we talked about it from a, from a leader's point of view and owner's point of view, but what do you do if you're a staff and you're not happy where you are? Should you suck it up and, and uh, apply it? Or wh what do you suggest that someone does that listens to this, that maybe it's not happy in their job, which is why they're disgruntled or disengaged? Well, first off, I think people, all of us need to take 100% responsibility for where we're at. If we don't like where we're at, we have two choices. We could either um, move, get a new seat, get a new position, maybe get a new job. Or if that's not possible, if that's not realistic, then change your perspective about the seat that you have. Because if you really want to stop and, and get re-engaged with your work and reignite into the passion of your work, stop and look at all the amazing benefits and all the amazing um, things that you can be grateful for of the job that you have. I mean, if you look at the global perspective, um, people would give their right arm to have the position that you have. So maybe we just need a, a perspective shift. And that's when I go in and do a an opening keynote presentation to my uh, corporate and association audiences, they they hear um, stories of encouragement and they hear stories of tenacity and they hear stories of inspiration to get people to really shift the perspective about the seat that they're in. So um, can I give you one of my favorite tenacity stories? You, you absolutely can. Let's hear it. Okay. Well, um, think of your bucket list of dreams and hopes and aspirations. So it's your literally a bucket with all of what you want out of your life. Your bucket list is filled. This bucket is filled with your hopes and dreams and aspirations, but there are holes in that bucket, dear Liza, and all of those hopes and dreams and aspirations are flowing out of the holes in your bucket. However, those, those holes are created by nails. Those nails are labeled and you hold the hammer and the labels could be it's different for everybody, but they're very common for everybody. Those, the labels of those nails that cause the holes in your bucket list are fear, negativity, doubt, shame, um, and, and insecurity in comparison to other people. And so guess what? You are 100% in control of your own fear, your own, your own doubt, your own shame, your own negativity, and your own comparison to other people. So what you have to do is you need to patch up those holes and you patch them up with courage, compassion, and kindness. And so one of my favorite stories is of this little boy in Florida who was a huge University of Tennessee fan. And I don't know why, because he lived in Florida, but he loved the University of Tennessee volunteers. And when his teacher announced that they were having a spirit day at their school, this little boy was so excited, even though he didn't have any money to buy a shirt, a cap, anything with a UT logo on it. So he made his own and he came to school and his teacher saw him. He was so proud. He had a big handmade sign taped to a T-shirt that was bright orange. And he went to school and she noticed that his head was held high. His shoulders were back and he was walking around proudly representing the University of Tennessee. And then this compassionate, kind teacher saw him after lunch and he did a whole 180. She noticed his energy was different. His head was down, his shoulders were down and he was off by himself. And she noticed and showed just a, a little bit of compassion by going up to him, getting down to his level and saying, hey, buddy, what's going on? And he looked up and she could see that he had been crying. And he said, they laughed at me because I am the only one in school who had a homemade T-shirt. And he was filled with shame. And she was immediately impacted by, oh my gosh, I've got to fix this. So she right. went on to right. literally on the Facebook and she said, does anybody have any connection to the University of Tennessee? Because I need a cap, a shirt, something. 
And it worked. That one act of kindness, because of her compassion for this child, 35 pounds of swag arrived wow. to wow. the elementary school. And the University of Tennessee got a hold of the story. And they literally took it to the next level. And they painted the big rock out front of campus, bright orange. And they transposed his design onto this huge rock so everybody could see this kid's design and then they made it their their t-shirt design for the year and they started selling these t-shirts and they had printers printing these t-shirts 24 hours a day seven days a week because so many people want these t-shirts and then this little kid was given a full ride scholarship to the university of tennessee by the chancellor and um and this story is so amazing because part of the proceeds of the sales of the t-shirts went to an anti-bullying campaign. And it's just been a few years now and they've raised $980,000 wow. to anti-bullying in schools. So when I tell that story in my keynotes, people are so moved. They're like, oh my gosh, this is just one act of kindness and one act of courage. What can I do? I can be more courageous. I can be more kind. I can do things to make an impact on the world. So um, people need to take responsibility for where they sit and who they sit with. And if you don't like where you're sitting, then either move or shift your perspective about the seat that you're in. Yeah, I, I agree with that so so much. I mean, in, in I've had multiple companies and I've had successes and failures and, you know, challenges like a lot of people. And at the end of the day, though, I always come back to I'm responsible. I'm 100 percent responsible where I am right now is a direct relationship to the decisions I've made or more importantly, failed to make. And yeah. so, you know, you can either be a victim or a victor, right? You can either take personal accountability and responsibility for your own actions, or you can play the blame game and point to everything else. You know, it's interesting when you think about the, the challenges that are facing organizations. Yeah, you know, a few months ago, um, of course, this is a live event today, but a few months from this recording, depends on when you're watching the replay, if you're watching the replay later. But a few months ago, it was really hard to find staff, right? It was, you had to pay double the amount. It was, you know, it was a job market. It was a, it was a, it was an employee market. Basically people were jumping ship and going to other companies because they were getting offered a few thousand dollars more. And I was talking to some of my colleagues and we were, we were saying, you know, that's fine right now, but that pendulum is going to shift back the other direction. And when that happens, if those other companies can't afford those new employees, they're going to be the first people to let go. So they maybe had a good job. They liked it. They left because they wanted a little bit more money. Then they go to the new company. The new company can't sustain the wage. And then they let them go. And now they're, they've lost, they've burned that bridge. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't pursue opportunities. We're both entrepreneurs. You should certainly add value, make a profit, right? That's one of my monikers you know, I talk about. So I have nothing wrong with, with having an aspiration. But you know, if you think the grass is greener in another opportunity, you still have to mow the dang lawn, right? So you know, it, it might look better over the fence, but, you know, I always think, you know, clean up your own neighborhood before you worry about your neighborhood and focus on the things that you can control. And at some points, you know, you have to make a decision. But I think the biggest thing, one of the takeaways that I've gotten today is, is get down to their level, ask questions, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, adapt your strategy to different people, mm -hmm. uh, set clear expectations, allow mm -hmm. them to, to fail and learn, give them a course correction. And then at that point, if they're not right, um, you have to, you know, invite them to go work for other companies. Is that well, what you're saying? No consequences. If there's no consequences, people will default back to the way that they always have been, because that's what happens when people go through change. And, you know, if you're a manager and you're managing your team, I don't want to gloss over the fact that the mental health in our country right now is at the forefront because people are really understanding um, depression is tough. So you, you have to be sensitive to this and find out how, how are they doing? Check in with people. Are they different? Check in with them. Let them know you care about them. Let them know that maybe there are resources that they can have access to to help them with their mental and physical health. So um, I, I want people to realize that you got to take it really, really seriously. Because if people don't feel heard, if they don't feel valued, topped with depression, and then you've got some chemical imbalance, um, their behavior could be um, soon very erratic. And so if people know that they're being heard, um, it lessens that, um, it lessens the effect. But also you, you need to know as a manager and a leader, you need to know what your boundaries are. There's only so much you can do before you need to refer them for some professional help. And there's nothing wrong with that either. So I think the first thing we can do is really um, care about our people, um, check in with our people, 
find out how they're really doing. And, and it's okay to say, well, what can I do to support you? And, um, and that can go a long way with your staff. Yeah. So as we, as we wrap up today's episode, um, for those of you watching live, if you want to learn more about Marilyn, her website's been shown on the screen the whole time. It'll be posted below MarilynSherman.com, a hall of fame keynote speaker and, and a great influencer, author of multiple books, including, is there a hole in your bucket list? It's a highly recommended that you jump on Amazon and you go get that and, and get one for all of your staff too. Um, so, so shameless plug. And while you're at it, get my lead magnet on the employee business strategies. All right. But anyway, but what I, I did want to address this, I really think authentically what's really important today is it's a leadership issue. First, it has to start at the organization and organizations. I think sometimes are challenged when I say organizations, owners, executives, their executive staff, sometimes are challenged with is this a leadership problem, mm -hmm. team building, communication, change, or culture? And there's five different topics. And so, you know, as speakers ourselves, when we get asked to go speak in an organization, they mm -hmm. think they want a leadership speaker or a motivational speaker, right? And well, what they want is they want someone inspiring, but they also yeah. want doable ta tactics. And one of the things that makes you and I both different is we're both Hall of Fame keynote speakers is yes, we're, we want to be inspiring and motivational. And we are, and our audiences love that because it, it's about how we can engage the audience, but it's also leaving them with doable tactics that they can apply to address their top challenges. Okay, so closing thoughts. What's, what's a closing thought that you'd like to leave with your listeners today if they're looking for ways to engage their staff or motivate their staff? Is there something, is there, uh, something they should do? Or obviously they can bring you in to speak for their organization. But other than that, what, what's a, a closing thought you'd like to leave with them? Um, people um, are really cool. And so yeah. um, it, it's worth it to reignite your people, reignite, reignite their passion, reignite their energy, reignite their, um, you know, why they come to work every day. And I think that starts with yourself. So maybe you can lead first and foremost by example and show how much you love your job, show how much you love your product or your service and your organization and your opportunities. So show up, be the leader, because when you're living your life in your front row, you can't help but shine a light for other people to see the possibility for them to live in their front row. So be an usher. I live in Las Vegas. And where all the conventions are, and right, and so there's an usher at every show in Las Vegas. <laughs> that, that's just an, we don't have a standing ovation today, so that's just that's just for you. <laughs> Is that for me to shut up? Because no, no, like, you keep going. I just was, I just was, I just thought that was an appropriate time for the standing ovation. Yes. So, uh, so an usher is someone who um, they literally have knowledge of where all the seats are in the house. And uh, they also have a flashlight and they look at your ticket and the usher says, oh, OK, follow me. And they lead you to the most direct path to your seat. And that's what leaders are. That's what managers are. You are an usher. You are illuminating the path for others. So illuminate that path for your people. Be that inspiration. Walk that talk. Show them what's possible. Have an amazing front row attitude every day and show them where the, where the seat of success is for them. And, um, and they will love that. You will get a response from people when you start living your life uh, with this front row philosophy. Well, thank you so much, Marilyn. So that brings us, well, there's no camera there. So we're gonna have to work on some testing here. So but I'm, gonna leave, I'm gonna bring Marilyn back up so we say goodbye with her on the screen. So Marilyn, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, if you've liked this episode, share it with your friends, put your comments. Do you agree with the front row philosophy? Um, you know, what are your, what are some of the top challenges and we'll address them on future shows. And I'm hopefully I can get you back on another episode. Uh, but I know you're busy out there speaking and training. All right. So that's it. Uh, Wednesdays, Thanks, 11 o'clock central. We go live and, and, and we'll do an AV check next time. It's my <laughs> fault. I'll take full responsibility starting with this, this conversation we just had. I take full responsibility. I could hear everything in my headphone, but my microphone for the broadcast wasn't set up right. So that's hundred percent on me not it my staff. So it, it it's all good. Out. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of this. Thanks everybody. I'll see you next Wednesday at 11 o'clock central. Bye for now. Thanks for, bye.